to um, introduce our speaker today, uh, a longtime friend of, um, of myself and also of the city of Long Beach, um, Patty LaPlace. Patty is currently a lecturer at Cal State University Long Beach in the Recreation and Leisure Studies Department. Uh, she's also uh, been a longtime advocate for the mental health field and she's worked in the mental health field for about it says 30 years here in the city of Long Beach and um, before uh, her work at Cal State Long Beach she was um, overseeing mental health services at the multi-service center in the city of Long Beach Health and Human Services. Um, so she is truly um, an advocate in this area and an expert in this area. So please help me welcome Patty Lewis. You know, when you're a lecturer, you have to learn to project, right? And especially I learned when you have an 8 o'clock class in the morning with students. Because my friend, my college students know waking up at 8 o'clock in the morning is tough, right? You need a lecturer to be able to project. So um, I'm used to being able to do it. So thank you. Um, and thank you, Kim, again for that wonderful introduction. However, I'm going to make one correction. And that is, I really don't consider myself an expert but I do consider myself an advocate. And I think why I say that is because even though I have a lot of experience in working with mental health, you know, really truly it's always learning something new. And I know for myself that, you know, I'm learning always something new about something related to mental health. Whether it's through personal experiences, whether it's through attending workshops, or whether it's through even having discussion with some of my colleagues or friends, you know, understanding mental health is really something that is a lifelong, you know, I believe, journey that we take and certainly understanding our own mental health. So thank you again for inviting me. I'm really pleased to be here and it's great to see some new faces as well as some familiar faces. Um, before I wanted to, you know, when I was asked to come and do this workshop, I started thinking to myself, you know, I really wanted to do something very different than normally when I do a presentation. And, Kim and I met for lunch and we had a bit of discussion. And part of this discussion stemmed from the domestic violence situation that happened a few months ago in Seal Beach. And some of you may remember about that, where we had a police captain and a woman that also worked for the city of Los Alamitos that were involved in a relationship that unfortunately ended in a very tragic, tragic situation, okay? and escalated to the point to where you know both victims ended up to be dead which was very tragic and i started thinking you know what happens you know when people are feeling victimized by domestic violence and what is it that maybe we can do as a community to help people build some resiliency to be able to address this situation be able to not only report but also to be able to seek out help before it gets to that point of violence, before it results into death, before it escalates where somebody ends up getting hurt. And I don't, I don't pretend to have those answers. Um, I think it's something that we have to look at. So this is going to be kind of a working meeting today, a working presentation, to get ideas from you because that's why I was listening very carefully to the introduction. I'm thinking there's people in this room that not, know more about domestic violence than I do. Whether you're in private practice, whether or not you're doing advocacy and education in that area, you all are more the experts than I am. And so I want to be able to, to really get feedback, get ideas, get kind of a sense of where you think maybe we need to go because I think it's very, very important that we have to understand that we can understand that domestic violence is an issue. We can understand that dealing with it within our community can be challenging. But somehow or another, and I kind of look at it even through my own personal journey through mental health, how do we give people the resilience and the power to be able to seek help, to be able to connect up to the resources, or even be able to address this issue at a point where it's early enough that that person can not only escape that situation and be safe, but hopefully people can get help and people can get connected with the resources. Because the resources are there, we just need to give people that opportunity and to empower individuals to be able to get the help that they need. So that's kind of where I'm going with this discussion today because I want all of you to kind of share, and again, because I, I listen and a lot of you are dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I think it's very, very important that we try to really solicit ideas and then maybe look at as a community. Because I think about End Abuse Long Beach, 
and I think about the, power, the things that you do within the community. So how can this group also help and do outreach in the community to sort of build resiliency for individuals so that people can then get the help that they need? So I can get my clicker going. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but you know these are my learning objectives for today. And I think the idea is, is that you know we want to maybe look at characteristics that really identify or look at or examine about emotional injury, because I think that oftentimes, you know, and this not is not only for people that are victims of domestic abuse, but also anybody that's been through trauma and how people go through emotional in injury and heal from that. Okay. And we want to guess, investigate reasons that impact someone's reluctance to seek help. And this is where I need help from you. And to really look at how we can help individuals feel empowered to get connected and get the help that they need. And you know, one of the things after that particular domestic violence situation, I went to, they had a town hall meeting and I decided to go attend and kind of learn a little bit about what people were feeling. And they had many women, for example, that were you know identified as victims of domestic abuse and of course you know um, integral house was very much sponsoring this and they had a lot of people do presentations and police officers came in and talked about it from a legal point of view so i learned a lot from that but what resonated for me during that whole time was that we wanted to give that person that help but that person was reluctant to get the help that they need and what's happening with that and, and what we can do again as a community to help empower those individuals and we also want to look at early intervention approaches you know coming from a mental health background and just like any time you're dealing with a condition or a situation the earliest we can intervene the earliest that we can help people get connected to the to the resources or the help or the therapy or whatever that they need, the better the outcomes, just like if we treat any kind of condition, health condition. So how we can be able to pay that way for individuals to do that. And then this is where you're gonna come in. We wanna talk about feasibility of options for identified strategies and next steps for implementation. And this is where I'm gonna ask all of you to do some work in that area. To really talk about, because when Kim and I were having lunch, we thought, what would happen you know, if we had a great team that could go out in the community to continue to engage that person that's been a victim of domestic violence to help empower and build that sense of resiliency within themselves. What would happen in that perfect world if we had that? And so maybe we don't have the perfect world, but maybe we have the resources and the ideas to make something like that happen. All right. So some of you are probably familiar with Suzanne Vega, right? And the song Luca. And you know, that always song, I remember the first time I heard it, and I had to really listen to it, I thought, wow, this is a song, right, about domestic violence. And so the idea is, you know, yes, I think I'm okay. I walked into the door again. Well, if you ask, that's what I'll say. Oh, and it's not your business anyway. I guess I'd like to be alone with nothing broken, nothing thrown. Just don't ask me how I am. I think, you know, that's a portion from that song. Obviously, there's other words. I think that song really speaks volumes, okay? It really sends that message about how individuals might feel. And the idea is, yes, it's there, but don't ask me about it. Don't ask me to talk about it, you know? I'm going to give you an excuse of why I might look this way because I didn't walk into that door again, right? Why people feel that sense of shame into feeling like they can't talk about the fact that they've been abused. And so I think it's important, you know, as we set the premise, and again, just don't ask me how I am. Don't ask me to go there. I think that's a powerful message about how often many, many individuals feel if they've been victims of domestic abuse. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I'm preaching to the choir here. But just to kind of set a premise about domestic violence and emotional abuse are behaviors, okay, used by one person in a relationship to control the other, okay? So we're talking about someone trying to control. And, you know, it talks about partners can be married, not married, heterosexual, gay, lesbian, living together, separated, or dating, okay? So anybody that's involved in kind of a relationship with someone can be considered to be a victim of domestic abuse. And again, I'm not going to go over this, just kind of setting the premise today of some definitions so that we can look at in terms of what we're working with. And certainly we see acts of violence as well as emotional 
abuse that's going on. And so how those kind of behaviors, when people experience them over and over again, and we're really talking about trauma, you know, begin to wear a person down. And even, you know, and as Kim and I, when we had lunch, we talked about the broad spectrum of individuals that are affected by domestic abuse. There's no race, you know, limitations. There's no economic limitations, okay? There's no age limitations. It can happen to anybody. I've even had students sometimes approach me and say they're in an abusive relationship, you know, where they didn't realize how they got into it and how they can get out, out of it. And luckily, we have great resources on campus and they help connect people to the right way. And I've even personally walked people over to our counseling and psychological services, you know, office through the walk-in to make sure that students get the help that they need as well. All right. So the one thing I want to do, and this is where we're going to have our first discussion, okay, is we're going to talk about powerless. You know, I don't know about you, but there are times in my life I feel powerless. You know, I sit there and I go, why is this happening to me? Why, you know, why, why, do, why can't things go my way? Why is it that I feel that this person is doing this to me and why can't I feel I can do anything about it? So when we look at powerless, you know, it's, it's, we feel devoid of strength and resources, right? I can't deal with this anymore. I can't handle this. I don't know where to turn for my help. Lacking authority or capacity to act. And of course, the noun version is powerlessness. Powerlessness, okay? And I think we've all had an opportunity to feel that way, unfortunately. What is it about powerlessness? So what I want you to do is maybe you could turn around and maybe in some small groups, about four or five of you at the table, I want to start this discussion out. Okay, so keeping the previous definitions in mind, in a small group, I want you to talk about the following with your group and see what you come up with. Talk about a time you felt powerless in a situation or with a person. What were the conditions surrounding the situation or person? In other words, why was this happening? What was going on around or what led to it? How did the perception influence your choices at that time? And how could you have turned powerless into powerful if you had that opportunity? If you could rewind that tape, how could you have changed that outcome? Okay? So I want you to take a moment in your groups, you know, four to five people per group at your table, and talk about that. Okay? Well. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There. I'm out of time when you feel powerless. Good for you. But what I'd like to do is maybe go around the room a little bit and maybe if someone wants to share just briefly their situation um, that they discussed with their group. Um, so if somebody is willing to do that, how about we start with you guys over here? So anything? <laughs> 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 Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure, you can leave out details. It's okay. Maybe just a brief. Yeah. yeah. Um, just my my situation was feeling powerless in a, in a job that I was in, and not feeling comfortable with what I was being asked to do or what was happening around me. Sure. And um, I didn't do any. I mean, I didn't do anything realistically to help the situation because I didn't. I didn't want to lose my job. Right. Yeah, that fear of losing that job, so it's like, do I say something and rock the boat, or do I, you know, do I just go along yes. because I need this job? And I think all of us have probably been in that situation, right? Yeah, you know, that need of, okay, I need this job, I have to work, but I don't like really what's going on. So, yeah, good example. Thanks, Kim. How about over here? So, I was, um, I shared that, like, I had a family member that was in a domestic violence situation, okay, and they had progressed so that it was very clear that that's what was going on and um, she was not ready to make that decision to leave so it's very frustrating and very you felt very powerless to like do anything because you knew that somebody you care about is being hurt right um, and yet you have no control over helping them or deciding to leave so you're you're trying to balance maintaining contact and maintaining a relationship while still feeling I can't Right. I don't know what to do and how not to support this, but support her. So I think that's probably yeah, that's um, a great example. I would be really, really powerless. Really. <laughs> well, and I think too, because that's what's hard in that situation. And for those of you that are probably working with domestic violence victims, 
probably that that idea of that it's clear to you what's going on it's clear to you in terms of um, that person needing to sort of separate themselves from that environment or that situation but that person isn't ready to do so and that's I think that's a really tough situation for anybody whether it's someone you personally know or even someone professionally that you're working with because we feel when we see someone being hurt and damaged and it's so clear to us that that's happening and that they can't see it themselves and why you know gosh it's right here it's right there why aren't why isn't that person doing what can help them you know and yet in their mind they're like but I, I'm doing what I think I need to do but it's very very difficult yeah great example how about back here what did you come up with uh, well I was in a marriage for 38 years okay. and it, it was not um, it was, it, there was no physical violence but it was certainly I was certainly oppressed and sure I didn't know what the hell was going on I just knew I didn't feel good and it took me the longest time to figure it out yeah well and I think you know that I think that you said something that's very important you knew you just didn't feel good but you somehow didn't make that connection that maybe was involving that relationship because I think we kind of acclimate ourselves to kind of just deal with it or excuse it or even ignore it or you know or maybe feel it's justified in some way so but you know I admire your courage that you finally recognized it and were able to separate yourself from that it's not an easy place to be so good for you all right, how about back there? Any examples of powerlessness or powerlessness that anybody wants to share about? I can give one. Okay, good. So I feel sometimes powerless. So my, I have a um, six-year-old grandson. Okay. And so when my daughter gets in her moods, it's almost like I can't get him. So it's like I'm powerless to have him exactly when I want him. Okay. And, you know, and I just feel like he's missing out on a lot because I'm, like, ready to be that... I mean, I, like for them, I traveled and did a lot with them. But for him, it's like I'm ready, like wherever, you know, it's time to go somewhere. I'm just ready to just take him with me. So, sure. you know, powerless to that because sometimes she lets me take him at odd times where I wouldn't even think I can get him. Like his fifth birthday, sure. he took a seven-day cruise with me and it was great. So sometimes I get frustrated because I want him every time I want him. And he yeah. has other, you know, he has other family members that want him just as much as I want him. So. Right. Right. powerless to him yeah. well and I think and, that, and that's a good thing about you know you have this desire mm -hmm. you know and it sounds like you're c clearly communicating this desire but you have to kind of be I don't know the right word mercy but maybe in the sense of that person's decision of what they're going to yeah. do mm -hmm. and that's you know and I think a lot of us could probably relate to that right mm -hmm. that there have been times it's like I want to do this but I'm kind of at the mercy of what someone else decides yeah. yes Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. How about this group here? I'm in a group of two. Okay. And I'm happy I met Amber. Um, I started off by, um, I was, instead of something personal, well, it is personal in that uh, the Seal Beach incident with the police yes. was very upsetting to me. Uh, a good friend of mine used to be in the city council. And he called him up and I said, don't they have EAP? Seal Beach, as far as I know, they still do. And this went on for over a year. Yeah. And they were covering it up. So the police yes. department became powerless because they wanted to prevent this lieutenant from getting shamed, right. et cetera. And so my point that I shared with Amber was powerlessness is learned. Yes. And so you can only be powerless if you give up your own personal power. Yeah. 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 And Amber is in the business of, of uh, being a mentor for people newly in, in DCFS sure. we're feeling powerless with this big system yeah and she's she's the expert in telling them how to navigate right yeah. well yeah. and good for you and thank you for doing that because that's an important role that you play but I, I also think it's very I actually even though I wasn't personally connected to the Seal Beach incident or even when you let's look at it when we're talking about abuse we want a broad base to now all the reports we have of women that are reporting reviews, right? It's all over the news every day, right? Mm -hmm. And what is it that at that time those women felt powerless because they were fearful of the consequences of the widespread, I want to make it in the movie business and this guy can help me get in there. So I guess even though I didn't like what happened to me, I'm going to keep my mouth shut, yeah. right? But that I, because of a bigger system. And that's kind of what you're talking about. Because I was affected to say, well, why is it so, someone should have been there every day and looking, why are they not doing it? Yeah, and it's like, and for whatever reason that they might be covering up or whatever things that are happening because they didn't want bad publicity or whatever, 
it created a really dangerous situation. And you're right about powerless is learned. And oftentimes it starts for many people at a very young age, right? Where they're kind of taught that they're powerless because they grew up in an abusive household where they were marginalized and minimized many times. But the point is you're poor and powerful. Yeah, we can be, and that's right. Everybody, they right. just cry and scream and they're hungry. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. Hungry. you're right. Yeah. Good, good point, thanks for sharing. <laughs> How about this group here? Anything that anybody wants to share? Or? Uh, uh. <laughs> well, I, I have cancer. Okay. And it, oh, I'm not even going to go into the type of cancer I have, but it's cancer. Okay. And, um, there's a lot of powerlessness with the medication. There is. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's, the, that's it. That's okay. But you're right. When you have a chronic illness or if you have a loved one with a chronic illness, right. there's a lot of powerlessness. Right. That's Especially felt. with the insurance companies. Oh, so yes. Yeah. Yeah, been there, done that. And I have really good insurance, but I'm just acting like a. Uh, I been there, done that. Well, I have better ways than that. But yeah, yeah. I I recently lost my spouse to cancer, and so I understand, and I believe me, I understand about fighting the insurance company. So I've been there. <laughs> Keep fighting. Go for it. Make yourself powerful, right? That's right. All right. How about, <laughs> how about this group here? Anybody? Well, uh, actually, both of us had a similar story where I was trying to help my nephew with his homework. She was trying to help her brother, and we just were like, uh, I don't really know how to help him. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with some of the stuff out today, right? Yes. Yes. Pressure, yes. Yes. Yeah. frustration on their part. Sure. So, it's that new sure. map. Yeah. Yes. It's that new map, right? <laughs> it's a lot of new everything, I know. Yeah. Yes. You're doing algebra, you're nine. Yeah, I know. Uh, isn't that amazing? I couldn't understand it when I was in when I was a like sophomore, old. right? And then nine years old, right? Yes. All right. How about our last group here? Anything in particular? <laughs> oh, what's <laughs> here? Hang on. <laughs> well, I I brought up um, at times I feel powerless when it comes to working with our clients, with our families, um, yeah. with our children, being able to, you know, provide whatever resources we're able to. Sometimes we feel like okay, we're not doing enough. Right. When in reality, it's like, you know, even the smallest things we're doing, we're actually, you know, being able to assist them. Right. You know, and, and sometimes I feel that we're very hard on ourselves, you know, and I've gone to realize that, um, you know, no matter what, in what way we try to assist them, any little thing <coughs> can, you know, provide that help or right. um, for the families or for you. So I, guess, yeah. I think that's a really good example. And I want to kind of zero in on what you talk about that basically kind of addresses our last question of our discussion, okay? Because how can you turn powerless into powerful? Because maybe it's about recognizing the little steps that we are doing or can accomplish with that, right? Instead of measuring things so large, you know, and saying, okay, you know, I'm not able to help that person by giving everything they need, instead of asking yourself, what is it that I was able to give them? And understand that within a larger system, we may have limitations, but we actually, I'm gonna echo what this gentleman said again, we actually are oftentimes more powerful, right, than we perceive ourselves in those situations because of our own self-perception, our own self-talk, our own personal beliefs about how, how we impact the situation. And I really believe that sometimes happens with victims of domestic abuse. They look at it as, I'm 100%, I can't do anything, I can't change that situation, without tapping into that there is an element of powerfulness that we do have, that we have to figure out a way to sort of tap into that and how we can help others tap into that and recognize that. So one of the things, thank you for everybody for sharing, good job, is now I want to talk about powerful. Because I think powerful within itself is an important word that I don't think we give ourselves enough credit, you know, to recognize. We may not have, you know, the power to change what's happening maybe within our environment or with or what how a person is treating us, but we do have the power, okay, of how we react or address or deal or even give ourselves credit in certain situations. So the idea is having great power, prestige, or influence leading to many important or important deductions. In other words, feeling that I, yes, I can be powerful in this situation and it doesn't have to be something that I feel like I have to earn 
or something that someone has to validate within me. This can come from within myself and how I can tap in. Because I really believe as human beings, we all have a sense of built-in resiliency, okay? The idea is sometimes we can't think that we're gonna survive the most horrible situation, but in actuality, we do in many cases, okay? Unless it results into death or, you know, injury. But in that salary, that's coming from somewhere. And how we can help people tap into that, I think is really, really important. So, I'm gonna ask you now to kind of switch it and just talk real briefly about when you felt powerful in a situation. Kind of that situation about how you felt powerful with the situation of persons, the conditions surrounding that, okay? And did perception influence your choices at the time? And how could you turn powerful to powerless in that situation? So we're going to kind of reserve, reverse the discussion a little bit. All right? So take a moment in your groups and just we'll spend about another five minutes doing that. How we might have felt powerful, okay, in a situation. So I'm going to start with this table back here, this group back here. Anything? Not that. The back table, I said, oh, I love you out the last time. They said, no, we're busy doing other stuff. So anyway, so we'll start with your group here. Anybody want to share about a situation they felt powerful? Well, I was, I was talking about how it was hard for me to find a situation where I felt powerful. Like, I felt empowered. Oh, okay. I like that. Because okay. the, for me, I guess, maybe working in domestic violence, the feeling powerful almost comes, and we connected it on, like, um, kind of on the heels of, you know, being powerful over something. Sure. You know? Okay. And feeling empowered was about the stuff. Okay. Know? Okay. And okay. so uh, we really talked about that and kind of dynamics of power and control and all of and really how um, we navigate through spaces with that. Yeah. And so in my specific situation that I shared was, uh, prior to the, my powerless situation, I shared with a supervisor who really made me feel very small and triggered, and I remember leaving that office crying uh, to the supervisor situation that I have now, where um, I was afforded this opportunity to write a summary for a published report, and I got really nervous because that's not my forte. Yeah. And I went to uh, the, my executive director, and, and, I said, um, I, and I said, he was an all right to say all right. You know, he's our ED, he needs about the report, I care about the data, he could have said, I'll write it. But what he said is, like, let's work together and, and I'll support you. How about you come up with some of this? And he walked me through the process and I felt so supported that I felt empowered in the end with right. with the final product. And I mean, I'm really proud of what, what it is and when it comes out. So. And I think you said a couple of things, and I, and I appreciate it, and I think changing that language to whatever is comfortable, certainly I can understand what you do for a living that you don't want to have. But I also want to say, isn't it too bad when we say powerful that brings up sometimes negative connotations? You know, someone powerful also may lead to control, right? Which I'm going to say doesn't necessarily have to, but I think that's our societal sort of viewpoint about those kinds of things. You know, it's like if someone is powerful, I can think about, you know, Harvey Weinstein, right? He's, yeah. People view him as powerful. And in his mind, powerful means control. But it doesn't have to mean that, right? Powerful can also be being empowered, right? Being empowered. But I appreciate, because yeah, I've been victim of that, you know, where a supervisor and I, I allow that feeling to be belittled, right? Mm -hmm. How many times have we done that? And then you walk out and you just kind of, oh my God, versus there's a, such a difference when someone says, I know you need to learn this, we're gonna do this together, okay? And that then in itself, because I think powerless, sometimes leads to feeling that we're alone. If we have someone there with us, we can feel more powerful or empowered. Make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing. How about this group here? Anything in particular anybody wants to share just briefly? Or? Um, well, I just uh, mentioned how, um, since I still have my parents, I mean, it's a bit rough. Okay. So, uh, when I could actually do the process, sure. I just felt empowered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's this. I don't know if you heard her say. So she lives with her parents, but she made a decision to study abroad. And she said that was a very empowering feeling to kind of say, "I'm exerting my independence now, right?" And that feels pretty powerful, doesn't it? Absolutely, in a good way. You're not trying to control or anything. You're just wanting to say, "Yeah, I can do this. I can go study abroad, and this is a way of myself demonstrating my own independence." Good. And always, it's never easy to leave the nest the first time, too. So, I definitely appreciate that. How about this group here? 
Well, we were actually talking about what you were talking about before, not so much individual situations. Okay. But the idea of the importance of connection and um, the engagement with somebody else and being able to mirror or sort of the idea of um, a magnet. You don't know how powerful it is until yes. you have that um, involvement. Yeah, and, and I think, and I appreciate that. I, I can know, even I can speak to that personally, you know, through some of, you know, my past struggles. It's like, why, but why is it within myself that I, you know, getting that outside help is good and we're not taking away from that, but what is it that keeps ourselves from giving ourselves permission to seek that out in the first place? What keeps ourselves? Because again, we don't want to maybe understand we haven't tapped into our own powerfulness or empowerment or whatever term we want to use to be able to say, yeah, I deserve that. I should have that. This is something that's con that can help me. And what kind of keeps people from being able to do that? I think that's the, that to me is the big question. You know, why we can't tap into our own resilience that is really already there, already there, okay? How about you? Well, actually, we spent most of the time talking about uh, Amber's um, process and, and journey and, and adventure. Uh, uh, now she's helping other women that were in her situation. Sure. And also, I'm feeling good about that and yeah. recognizing how to give other women power because of what she went through and mistakes and, and successes she had. And also, I mean, to give her a lot of credit, she's in important on, on track for getting a, an RN, an LBN, and get, becoming a nurse. Good for you, congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I bet, and, and if I may add, and Amber, and I think it's great, you know, individuals like you and the role that you play is such an important, important part of this. But did you find, if I can ask you, and if you're comfortable answering, did you find yourself surprised about your own personal resilience immediately when you started getting more into this role about sharing it with others? Yeah. 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 That's what I, I wondered about this. Like, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I am stronger than I thought I was. I am, you know. I do have more power than I thought I did. Yeah, yeah because, I mean, for me, I was in a really bad domestic violence relationship for 11 years starting at the age of 17. Wow. So just not being educated, you know, at first it was, oh, he's not hitting me, so I'm not being abused, you know, sure. being uneducated and then going through that process and, you know, then being with DCFS and, you know, that whole thing um, and being able to overcome that and, and you really start to feel like your partner is like a, your drug, like you need that person to right. go on and to be able to stand up on my own two feet, you know, I've had custody of the kids since 2012, I've done it all on my own, he hasn't had visits, you know, going to nursing school, working now, um, you know, so it's like, okay, I can see where I, I was and where I've come, and, you know, the, the opportunities are endless, yeah. Wow, you're pretty powerful, isn't that? That's real, that's power, that's a good power base, absolutely. All right, back here real briefly, just anything that you want to share? Um, I was talking about how I feel very powerless in the work that I do. I work in medicine, mm -hmm. um, and as a mental health person, it is sure. a, a really toxic <coughs> environment um, for me. Uh, but I deployed twice to both to Texas and up to NorCal for the disasters, both for Harvey and wow. for the fires. Wow. Um, and realizing that uh, my skills are exactly the same, but the environment being different was really different. I had a lot of power. Oh, wow. Um, being able to help people on the spot all the time for like 15 hour days uh, when I was deployed and then realizing like, oh, the situation does really matter. Like, yes, yes we all have power. Yes, yeah. we give it away. But there, there is stuff that is outside of us. Well, and um, I think there's, there, there's, there's what I call environments that are nurturing a power, <laughs> environments that sort of suck it out of you. Yeah. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. You know, I, and I've worked in both. I've worked in both. And I understand, you know, that aspect of, like, wow, when I'm in the right environment, I know my stuff. I can get in it. I can do it. So, great story. How about anybody over here? Anybody want to share in this group here? Yeah. Uh, well, I can share, I guess. Um, I found some personal power in getting my uh, anger management under control. Ah. And when um, it took me 10 years of therapy and a lot of reading uh, The Dance of Anger over and over and over again um, to because I would react and I looked like the crazy person and the emotional person and I was dismissed and discounted and when I got that turned around 
and was calm, then he turned into being a crazy person without me. Right. You know? right. And that was extremely powerful. I bet. Me, so. Yeah. I bet. And, I, and I also, you know, in hearing that, and, I, and I'm saying this because I do this myself, well, when I finally did this, when I finally, but you did it. Yeah. You did. You found a way to finally tap into that that was already there, and you did it. So give yourself a lot of credit for that. That's not an easy thing to do. Oh yeah, I do. Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. Because a lot of times, well, like I said, well, I remember one time someone said, "Oh, you deal with these." Things. Well, after so many years of therapy, I better deal with this stuff, right? Right? Instead of sitting back and giving myself credit that I, I sought that in the beginning, right? That I was willing to even do that, you know. But yet, it doesn't. Sometimes not even. How long it takes, the fact that you did it is what's important. So, yeah. Anything you guys want to share? Or? Um, so, my situation basically both times is to do with dealing with my clients. My okay. clients are all domestic violence victims. Wow. And I do custody and visitation cases with them. Oh, cool. And it's very heartbreaking when the clients come and they say, you know, he's done this to me all these years. How does he get to see the kids? Yeah. But the law states right. that he gets to see the kids. So, it's powerlessness in terms of. <coughs> What's gonna the outcome of the case is not gonna be what you think it should be, um, but the powerfulness is when I have a case that just goes right. Yeah. Um, and I had a case this summer where the guy violated the court order. It was clear um, the court order was from out of state. I never met the client, um, and then you know the case came to me, and I was like, "This is wrong. I know what to do about it." I wrote the brief. I appeared for her. We got the court order. She flew in. She took the child home, and I was like. Yay! <laughs> those are those wonderful outcomes. Yeah. And that validates what you do. Because but it doesn't happen often. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think a lot of us that have worked in those areas, and I call them goodies. Yeah. I usually call them goodies because, you know, many years I'd work in, in mental health and I'd see clients cycle in and out and not get connected and decompensate or whatever. But once in a while you have those, take those goodies and make those powerful. Yes. Thank you for sharing. So the idea, and I think you see where I'm going here. The idea is, is that I want us as a group to kind of think about how we can get people to tap into their own personal resilience and how we can help empower people to know that that does indeed exist in all of us. Because I agree with you, we're already born powerful. It's that somehow or another we allow that to diminish or be taken away. And it could be, you know, for some of us it could have started at an early age where we were raised in an abusive household and so we end up going to and recreating that abuse over and over again in different choices that we do in our lives. Or we also find ways of allowing someone to be powerful over us that means control. You had a hand? Yeah, and, I, and in the last example, I think part of powerfulness is being able to cope with failures along the way. Yes. But you continue to be powerful because you continue to do your best. Right. There's, and you can still no validate guarantees. yourself. It didn't go the way I wanted it to, but... So I'm going to give up. Yeah. That, yeah. That, but no. she doesn't give up. She no. keeps fighting. No, she actually, That's the she power. Doesn't. That's the powerful. Absolutely. That's right. All right. So I want to take, as I know, I realize, oh, I have all this time, but now I don't. But you know, talk about it always happens when you present, right? So the idea with emotional injury, and this is kind of what we're talking about when we look at powerlessness, okay, is that we have emotional injury that happens to us. I mean, physical injury, yes, that tends to be more visible. But emotional injury, okay, that's the stuff that I think is really difficult to heal because sometimes in those situations, especially if someone has a lot of emotional injury and a lot of history of trauma, they just inadvertently put themselves back in situations they're not conscious of it to reopen up those wounds of emotional injury again over and over so they never completely heal. They never completely heal, and they just get opened up a little bit more and more, and they might heal a little bit temporarily, but they never fully heal. And to me, that's a lot of that core, that unhealed emotional injury that I think impacts people to tap into their own power, powerlessness or powerfulness. And the idea is, is that these are kinds of the things that happen. So, and I always tell people, our bodies have a good way of communicating to us about things that are not right, but we don't often listen, right? We might listen to the fact that, oh yeah, I'm depressed, whatever, but anxiety, for example, that is oftentimes, you know, because we have to understand, anxiety is not just an emotional, it's triggered off by a physiological response. 
And in many cases, anxiety through the midbrain of our survival is because you're not finding any sort of resolution to keep yourself safe. So that anxiety just comes up, that whole physiological experience, well, emotional experience of anxiety keeps people at a level of feeling unsafe or powerless. Okay? But the idea is, is that each one of these is our body, whether it's emotionally or physiologically communicating to us, is letting us know that we're not tapping into things that can help us feel more empowered or powerful. I love Mary Tyler Moore. She's one of my favorites. She's always been my idol. I grew up in the, you know, in the time when she was like this independent woman living in Minneapolis, right? But I, I found this quote to just really when we talk about resilience, and I thought this is something that's really important because I know I can get into sort of, why isn't anything good? Why am I having all this crap happy? Blah, 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 blah. Now, once again, you know, I'm being put down. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And she said, you can't be brave if you only have wonderful things happen to you. That oftentimes our negative experiences and our perceptions about those is really what helps us build that resilience, right? And helps us to understand that, help us maybe encourages us to tap into that. So the idea is, is that it's okay if we have negative things happen. And I'm not saying okay like, yeah, we love it or whatever, but that, that's part of our own personal emotional growth that we can carry that, use that experiences, just like Amber shared, she's using her experiences, right, to be able to carry her on and reach her life goals and open up her perspective into things and to also set boundaries in her life to say, no, I'm not gonna allow myself to be exposed to this kind of thing because I, I have goals and things that I do. She has tapped into her powerfulness as a result of her negative experiences. So, my question for all of you, is how can we help victims of domestic violence move from emotional injury to resiliency? And I think this is an important question. And I don't have the answer. I don't have the answer. But I think the bigger picture is, is what can we do as a community to try to encourage people that they can be powerful, or what can we do? And you know, we were talking over there about the situation with the Los Alamitos police and you know what happened in there. And I think what was sad for me when I heard, you know, they kind of gave a timeline about how things happened. And I thought, wow, there's red flags popping up all over the place that this particular situation could lead to a tragedy, and it did. So what? What happened with those red flags? You know, how did individuals that were trying to outreach and help, you know, whether it's from a law enforcement or whether it's from domestic abuse, you know, support groups or domestic abuse outreach, how is it that we weren't able to address those red flags? And that person that was experiencing this abuse, how is it that they continue to allow that situation to continue, what was going on with them. And I really believe because a lot of that unhealed emotional injury that people then begin to feel powerless. And how we can turn that around to help people feel powerful. So that's my big question for all of you today. What can we do? What are some strategies within the community that we can help people. And I'm gonna give you an example. You know, we don't have Wi-Fi access, but I actually found this interesting YouTube video. And I use this a lot when I teach as well, because it helps keep students awake. But it was called, remember the TV episode, What Would You Do? Have you yes. seen that TV episode? And they actually did one on a domestic violence situation where, you know, the gentleman, it was like they were in a restaurant and the guy comes in and he starts yelling at the woman and they wanted to see what other people would do around that. And it was interesting because some people kind of just got embarrassed and walked out of there thinking this is really uncomfortable. And other people felt this compelled to act, okay? But the bigger picture is the person, the woman, it happened to be a woman in this situation that was playing the role of the abused, of the, of the, the victim of the abuse, she had a very common demeanor that people might think. She was very powerless. What would happen if we change the script a little bit from that to what happened if that woman just said, hey, I'm not gonna take that stuff from you. And what would you do in that situation? Why is it, because I think oftentimes, and again, I think the media, as well as other messages we have, that we have that people that are 
victims of, of domestic abuse are always going to be victims, and we know for the fact that it isn't the case. But the bigger picture is why, as a society, we continue to portray those people to look victimized all the time. What would happen if we changed that up? And so, really, for me, how can we help? What is it that we can do as a community to help people tap into that sort of resiliency? And I, that's why I had the discussions earlier, because you tapped into your own resiliency at some point, talking about situations you felt powerful about in that kind of situation. How can we help change that up to help others do that? In more of a broad sense, and I'm not talking about, certainly if you are you know, a therapist or you are someone that's working with someone on a one-to-one, -one, yeah, you're doing those kinds of things already. But I'm talking about, because we know that domestic abuse is still continuing to be a problem in our society. And we see it and we hear about it. You know, we, and unfortunately, when it comes on the news, it's usually because it's ended in some sort of tragedy, right? How can we change that? How can we change that? Or can we give more newsworthy things to people that have survived it? You know, I would like to read in the paper about Amy's situation. That would be something that would be more, something more wonderful to tap into than somebody who was victimized and ended up dying or tragedy. So, anybody, what do you think? How can we? Anybody have any ideas? Yes. Um, one thing that came to mind was something that Andrea mentioned as far as um, the education um, mm -hmm. and really kind of breaking down the stigma or what DV or IDV actually looks like. Yes. Um, and it's not just physical violence, that there's so many yes. other different small factors that don't always lead up to the physical violence, but it's still going on and right. that still fits within that, you know, that, that label as well. Right. So maybe about maybe providing a little bit more broader based education and tap into those kinds of things. Good, good. What else, Kim? Well, as I was screaming at the TV this week, um, Texas um, oh, situation, yes. and they said there was no motive and no warning signs. But on a side note, he was arrested for domestic violence, and I'm screaming. That's your warning. Exactly. Yes. Yes. I, yes. I said to my husband, I go, you know. I know my friend Beth in Sacramento will be on the TV or news today talking about the intersection, and she was. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to do is just keep getting out there and saying there is a connection. Yes. And it doesn't have to end in mass murders, and it doesn't have to end. Right. There were so many places that they could have stopped right, the violence. Yeah. And that's, that goes back to that red flag situation yeah. that many of us go back and go, oh, but what? I think in what is it that we can do to help raise that awareness about those red flags? And yeah, not all those situations may lead to a mass shooting, but it's a red flag for somewhere. And what I say too, that that person, you know, as much as horrific of what he did, that person was very much emotionally injured, had deep rooted emotional injury, you know, and where, what happened at that some point that we couldn't find a way to intervene before it came to that level. Yes. And I think it speaks volumes that the United States Air Force did not have a code in their computer yeah. to record domestic violence. Yeah, you know, that's, I thought that was interesting too. I heard that and I went, what? Yeah. 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 So I, that tells me that as a society, we still have denial going on, right? Yes, and to recognize that yes, that is an indicator. But again, that's a person that really, truly needs help. Yes. Hi. So I was kind of thinking about, um, you know, K-12 environments, right? Sure. So children um, sometimes suffer in silence in, in those environments, but they are in an environment where a teacher can be a turnaround person for them. Yes. So so while there may be some isolation, there's also an environment that can that can lead to somebody making it through. And so research shows that that a teacher or an adult can make a difference in a child's life at that at that time. Absolutely. So so then you you look at domestic violence and you and you've got the isolation and just the cutting off of all the relationships. And so it feels like that there's some way that there can be a connection made to an individual who's going through it, not after they've gone through it. Yes. But there, and I don't know what that what that looks like, but there's some way to implant people next to each other and go side by side through it. Yes. That maybe turn around people. I appreciate what you said, Amber, about the, the kind of addictive quality of it. You know, it's like yes. there is another way to get out of it, but if no one's there and there's no environment to support it, it can just this is this is kind of what where you're at. But if someone was there saying, "Come on, let's let's, let's walk this together," and I, I just don't know how to make that happen. Right. But, but I think you're on the right track, and maybe having that 
that. And like I said, like that early intervention sort of strategy I think that you're talking about in the bigger picture is maybe create something within the schools that could be sort of that safe haven that a child could at least go and start to address this, you know, and how, what that would look like, but I challenge you to kind of think about that in that way. How can we create that? Because you're right. We know that there's oftentimes healthier environments than once that person is exposed to. And I think some of you shared that. I know that I know she had to leave early, but she shared about, or no, you shared about, that's right, about when you were out in the community, you felt a healthier environment, okay, to be able to feel powerful in doing what you were doing. Um, how can you then try to bring that to the current places where you feel powerless? How to just sort of create that. And I'm not saying it's going to be perfect, but maybe it starts with an ear that we first have to build in with our resilience. Yes. Yeah, so, so I just, I just want, I, I wasn't necessarily saying that for domestic violence that, that it has to go back to school, though it can. Right. I was using it as just an analogy. That, sure. That there are places where people interact. Yes. And, and nobody knows what's happening with them, and there's too much isolation and fear based and the threat of power being used. So there are places sure. where there's interaction, but those aren't set up to yes. sort of like to say, hey, somebody next to you could use a hand right now and right. help them. You know what I mean? Yes. So like, like it's, that's uh, probably a side of change. But looking at those other places where we're physically in contact with people, we just don't know what's going on. Not right. alone. Not alone. Yeah. And, and right. so I just I, I use school as an example because sure. it's been studied so much, and teachers are there all the time, and they can be. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, and thank you for clarifying. And I, and I think if I understand what you're saying is that how can we create more environments that help people build resilience? You know, how can we help create more safe environments that help people tap into their own personal resiliency? Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say, uh, it's actually backing up a little bit to the example you gave of the, the woman in the, in the, where they were um, testing to see how people right. react. Yes. And I think things that goes along with educating the public and being more aware of the different levels of violence is that oftentimes um, we see when women are or whoever the victim is sure. um, is resilient and maybe not um, not looking like the victim or right. defending themselves or even arguing back or whatever then often that's dismissed as oh, well that's not that situation because she's being she, it's a code Argument, right? You know, yeah, that's a really that. interesting point. I think yes. that um, <coughs> at least I am sure any of us who've worked with domestic violence in the past know that often that sort of what happens towards the end of the relationship before it blows up is that sure. as that resiliency is developed and as that power starts happening, that victim starts fighting back, and right. and then it sort of gets dismissed as well. That doesn't count. And right. so I think that's also part of the language change that we have to look at because we've seen you know other people go well, that's not even in some of our buildings so right that's not really domestic violence because they're both fighting yeah and I'm like yeah but it is and so i think that's sure. part of the conversation change too yeah and that's a really excellent point you know and that's what i thought about because i thought what happened if she would fight back and would people still react in the same way because he was still being abusive but she's saying no i mean she's still being abused mm -hmm. even though she's fighting back right but how that, we can't look at that, well, that must not be as serious or something. We might dismiss it. I think that's an excellent point, Julie. So maybe changing up the idea of people's understanding about what it is, that, that doesn't mean just because you fight back doesn't still mean that you're not being victimized. Absolutely, yeah. Any other thoughts? Great discussion, by the way. Thank mm -hmm. you. So Tori got me thinking when he said grocery store, because I'm thinking like there's so much empty real estate, commercial real estate. Right, because of all this online stuff, but our victims all go to the grocery store. Until, yes. until they're all shopping online at the moment, they still all go to the grocery there store. So like, what if next to a grocery store, there was like a walk-in center, you know, that was not just for domestic violence victims, because they'd be too ashamed to come in, but just like, come in if you need a break, bring your kids for, if you need, yeah. you know, come and sit down and have a cup of tea. If it was like a resource center with counselors there, and they could address whatever issues a person had that day. I love that. Yeah. Isn't that a great idea? Yeah. See, I knew you. I'm in a room full of experts. I knew I was a great idea. But I think what you say is very powerful. I think what you say, and I'm going to use the word powerful because it destigmatizes the issue. It destigmatizes. And I think that's a lot of, you know, I can relate to it from a mental health because I can remember many times and, you know, 
Pam shared, and I know I have to wrap things up a little bit. I know I had one, I think I had another hand, but I'll get to that in a minute. But I can remember, you know, working at the multi-service center, and I would walk in as a mental health coordinator and say, yeah, this person has mental health. And I, you know, and people, ah, I don't want to be labeled this, I don't want that, I, I don't want people to think that I can't handle things. As if, first of all, I'm trying to validate you are handling things. That's first of all. You know, a lot of times we're our own worst enemy, thinking I'm not handling this very well. Many times we are just fine, right? We're just doing the best we can given the resources that we might have. And I finally looked at someone, I said, you know, if you, someone told you, you know, and, and excuse me for counting in, but this was a powerful thing. If someone told you you had cancer, would you refuse to get treatment? Of course not, you know. Would you go, what would you, would, if I referred you to an oncologist to treat your cancer because I felt that was the person best educated to be able to deal, that was their specialty? Absolutely. I said, so this is the same for mental health. Mm -hmm. It's a health condition. It's a health condition. So we want to refer you to the best specialist in that condition. You know, and sometimes it often took rewording that kind of language to destigmatize that. So what can we do to kind of destigmatize domestic violence, so, and how we can create safe havens, safe environments, places where people can go, that they can feel comfortable and safe to say, this is happening to me and I need some help. Because we can't. The one thing that I, I've learned and, you know, I've understood that even through our most tragic struggles, we often think we have to deal with it alone. Guess what? We're human beings and we're animals, we're social animals. We need others to help us through that. And we have better outcomes when we get have people, others to help us through that journey because in emotional injury, we're not thinking straight. We oftentimes don't have a good perception about it. We need someone to have a clear perception about what's happening so that we can say, for example, the great um, example Jaylene said, you know, if someone is fighting back or someone is standing up for themselves, doesn't mean that they're still not being victimized by domestic violence. And I think that's a really powerful thing. So I appreciate it. All right. Any other questions? Okay, I'm sorry, but we just started talking. You know, in the LGBT community, the, the presence of an ally yes. is a strong statement. And Absolutely. how do you know if you have an ally? And it's often because there's a sign on your door, on your office, or yes. you wear a badge or something. Yes. And that's like a public statement that, that you know, this, this network needs to be there. Yeah. And what if we had a similar thing it's like I'm somebody who Allies. you can speak to about DV, I love and what would that. that mean if you're at the grocery store and you saw somebody wearing that? Would you, you know what I mean? Because I love that, like some sort of campaign, because that that would take the stigma out a little bit and, yes. and raise it up. And say, this is a real. Thing. I know even, you know, part, I'm not part of the Mental Health America Board and we have a sign that says one in four, right, for mental illness. And the saying that, yeah, I'm one of those one in four, you know, and so you could come and talk to me about mental illness because I'm comfortable about sharing about my experiences. And to be personal, yes, I am a one in four person. You know, those are the important things. So really, I, I guess that's all for my presentation today. I want to thank all of you for your end the show okay because you've already talked thank about you it. So, okay. it was nice to we hear some uh, we have your email address on okay yeah my email okay very good <laughs> so thanks again it was yeah, great thank you. Thank you.